this body of people right here and every other local church that's out there this morning or whenever they worship this weekend matters. Matters to God. It matters to the world in which we live. Today's sermon in 1 Timothy 3 takes us to a short passage, a short text about why the existence of the church matters. We've, we've talked about why, why truth matters. We've talked about why um, pastors matter. Why, last week was why servant leaders, deacons, why they matter. But then this short little text here is really, in my opinion, it's the, it's the theme of the whole entire book. Why the existence of the church matters. We're led to believe, church, that um, today, that what we're doing this morning, gathering together, and our existence throughout the week as a, as a body of people, that the church of Christ in the world today just doesn't matter anymore. That our communities in which we live, that our families, that our governments would be better without us. Does the church still matter? I, I hitched my wagon to the church a long time ago. I, I believe that it, this, this body and every other body of a gospel-believing church is so significant. It was, it was God working through the body of Christ, through the church, that changed my life forever. Not, not because I'm a pastor and this is my vocation. I'm talking about when I was a, a teenage boy, God used the body of Christ to influence me in such a way where I was saved because of the work of the, the local body of Christ. I was baptized because of the local body of Christ. I was told over and over again by the local body of Christ that I needed to preach, that I needed to be a pastor, which I pushed that off as long as possible until God got my attention. It was the local church that came alongside our family during hard times. Even several years ago, uh, I went through, a, and this is a different sermon for a different time, but from like... 2012 until 2017, um, it was just one death after another in my family. Nieces and nephews and then my mother and then my father. And the whole time, it was the church that just kept stepping in to uh, alleviate all of that um, frustration and emotion and to walk alongside my family. I, I just believe so much in the local church. To I would turn it around to our culture and say the church, the culture says the church doesn't matter anymore. I would say that our culture doesn't matter without the church. Amen. David Watson in his book wrote this. He said, I believe in the church. That's the title of the book, by the way. I believe in the church. And he goes on to say, It is the church that is willing to die to worldly standards that will know the power of Christ's resurrection. It may be envied for its depths of loving relationships or its spontaneous joy. It may be hated and persecuted for its revolutionary lifestyle, exposing the hollow values and destructive selfishness of the society it seeks to serve. But it certainly cannot be ignored. When God reigns among His people, they become a city set on a hill and cannot be hidden. I believe in the church with all my heart. It is needed now more than ever. Let's pray as we go to God's Word. Lord, I ask as we encounter your word this morning that you would speak afresh to us. 
that you would reinforce in us the ideals of your word and your son, Jesus Christ, and that you would solidify in us the importance of this work that we do as a body of Christ. We are your plan A. There is no plan B. I pray that we would leave this place charged up and ready to be a difference in the culture in which we live, and that we will not be ashamed as workers of the gospel of Christ. Bless this time in your word now, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 14, Paul says this to the churches, to Timothy and the churches in Ephesus. He says, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. The church is needed today. It's needed. And what I want to share with you is about five things today that Paul says make the church significant. They, they should reinforce in us why who we are and what we do matters. And the first that Paul says is this. Why does the church matter? Why is the church needed? Because it's in the church that we find godly fellowship. It's in the church that we find godly fellowship. This is in verse 14. Paul says, I hope to come to you soon. Now you think, wow, that's a pretty innocuous statement. Is it really that deep? Is it really that significant when it comes to scriptural meaning? Absolutely. Absolutely. Whether writing to individuals or in the church or writing to small groups or whether writing to entire churches, this was a common refrain of Paul's in the letters that he wrote. If he wasn't with the church, he wanted to be with the church. If there were people in the church that he wasn't with or seeing, he, he spoke of those individuals in the church with such loving and endearing terms, and he couldn't wait to be around them. All Paul wanted to do was be in the midst of God's people. It was significant to him over and over again. He would say it in his epistles and in his teachings. Why? Because he found refreshment, he found restoration when he was in the midst of the people of God. When I hang out with you fine folks, whether you're older than me or younger than me or the same age as me, it doesn't matter. Whether you're the same color I am or a different color than I am, whether you speak a different language than I do, when we're around God's people... We feel refreshed and recharged and re-energized for the mission, right? If the church is doing what it's supposed to be doing. I mean, I've been around some sandpaper churches, you know what I mean? Like where you go and you can tell by the countenance and the behavior and the tone of everybody in the church that they can't wait to get out of there, right? Like, oh, I'm here, I'm checking this box, but in a half an hour I need to... He better be done in a half an hour because I got reservations. <laughs> You're my reservation. In Romans 15, Paul said this to the believers in Rome. He said, I, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be accept acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Do you feel that way when you come here? When you hang out with God's people, do you feel refreshed? Yes. Th this church, more than many that I've ever been a part of, is just like a it's like a, 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 a spiritual healing balm. It is a, uh, it's like an energizer bunny 
for my soul. It's a joy to be around you fine folks. And I pray with my weird sense of humor and odd mannerisms that you likewise would say the same thing, that it's actually pleasant to be around that guy. Do, do we view the church in this way? Is it another obligation we do? Is it a religious duty? Is church a religious thing that we do? Or is it a people that feed our soul? Paul saw it as the latter. I've never understood those who say they're believers but refuse their need for the church. I think it's like saying, I want to be married to my husband. I just don't want to touch him, laugh with him, spend time with him, or pray with him. <laughs> right? Now, if that's what you view of your husband, then I'm available for counseling. <laughs> but in reality, we're the bride of Christ. We should look and operate as a body of people who love one another and find and and do not tire of telling other people this it's good for one another to hear from another person that you um you move me you you your love for me is such encouragement being around you refreshes me gosh talk about being able to make a person's day to be able to hear that from somebody else so in this church, we find godly fellowship. And fellowship is, is, is a very biblical term. It's, you don't hear it much in culture anymore, but it's definitely a, a biblical term, koinonia. It means that we have everything. Koine is the Greek word for common. It means that we have all things in common. Because if we have Christ, we do have all things in common. Because without him, we have nothing, right? The church is needed because we find godly fellowship. But secondly, I would say this, according to Paul's letter to Timothy, the church is needed because in it, we learn godly behavior. I, even, I mentioned being a, a young teenage boy in the church. As a young teenage boy... Being around God's people is where be God began to solidify in me what it means to look like a Christian, to act like a Christian. Those disciplines and behaviors that are needed to grow as a Christian. Paul said uh, in verse 15 that we just read, If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. So this isn't me just saying to you in some sort of autocratic religious way, you come to church so you know how to behave properly. Paul is saying through the Holy Spirit that he actually enjoys being around God's people because when we're around God's people as a church, we learn behaviors that matter to God. It's the main purpose for writing this letter, by the way. I believe that this is the, the, the thematic high point of this epistle. Those who've been in the church for any length of time, I don't think it would take much thought on your part before you could share something you learned about godly behavior by being in the church. Right? Uh, hopefully, the church is rubbed off on you a little bit by being around God's people. Maybe you learned how to pray in church. Um, uh, some people can clearly look at a point in time in their church history and remember the first time they prayed out loud. First time they offered service either to an individual or to the corporate church. The first time they did something to tangibly honor God. The first time maybe they put uh, a small amount of money in the offering plate. Or the first time they made a truly sacrificial gift 
to the church. We learn right and wrong and the practices that go along with those things and the habits that go along with those things. And we learn how to love unconditionally in the church. It's a safe place to be able to do that because we find grace here. We find grace. If we try and serve the Lord and we don't do it quite right, uh, maybe we fall and we skin our knee. Maybe we um, you know, stand up publicly and for the first time we want to we want to pray out loud or we want to share a gift with the church, a talent. We want to sing, whatever it is. And it doesn't go quite right. This is a place where the church loves no matter what. We don't love because somebody sings great. We don't love, clearly, I mean, you let me sing on Sunday morning. You don't love me because I sing great. We just love because Christ first loved us. Somebody gets up and they, they start using like strange, you know, very secular language, but they're trying really hard to just pray from their heart to God. And it's the first time they've ever done that. They need to find this as a safe place to do those things. Maybe 10 years ago, I met a, a guy who just, he inspires me. His name is Mez McConnell. I was at a, a meeting outside of Hershey, Pennsylvania, and he uh, was one of our uh, guest speakers. And it was just a small group of pastors, like maybe 12 of us. Mez is a church planter with a vision to start as many churches as possible in the poorest communities and apartment complexes in Edinburgh, Scotland. He wrote a book about this endeavor called Church in Hard Places. And he said in that book, I think, two really important things. And he, and he reiterated this when he was sharing with us. He said the church is where people learn spiritual submission. They learn how to submit themselves spiritually to Christ by learning how to submit themselves spiritually one to another. There are some things that you may not naturally want to do, but because the church needs you to do it, you submit and you do those things. Hebrews 13, 17. Paul writes this. I don't say Paul. I just tip my hand as to who I think wrote Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews says this, because we don't really know who wrote Hebrews. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. I know some churches where the leaders are groaning because there's no spiritual submission going on. There's only headbutting and pushback and fighting. And those churches become unhealthy and they tend to spiral into bad places. So Mez McConnell in his book, he said that Churches that are healthy are where people learn spiritual submission. But he also said churches are places where we find accountability and spiritual discipline. Spiritual discipline, that's, that's where we... Um, accountability is where uh, you have the right to speak truth into my life. And if I'm out of line, you have the right to call me on that and vice versa. If I'm going somewhere that is um, contrary to Scripture and its authority, you have a right to hold me in account, and vice versa. We welcome that accountability into our life. Because ultimately, my opinions don't matter, and your opinions don't matter. Your preferences don't matter as much and my preferences don't matter as much as the truth of God's Word. That needs to be the standard. So, with accountability, there has to be discipline. If my, if my father never followed, if, if my father tried to hold me accountable 
as a, a, a young teenager or as a rambunctious child, but he never followed through with the discipline side of it, then the accountability would have meant nothing. God has also, in his word, authorized the church to be a place where if we do get out of line, the church can discipline, enact discipline upon those. So why does, this, why does it matter? Why does it matter that, that this is an important point in why the church matters? Because we become better followers of Christ and we look more like him as we submit ourselves to the authority of the church. I think these are keys to godly behavior not find, found elsewhere in life. We live in a culture today that is saying, it's screaming at our young people, you be you and don't let anybody else tell you anything that you need to do or any way that you need to act. You do whatever you want to do. Whatever makes you happy. And sadly, some churches have adopted this philosophy in order to be welcoming and inclusive of all people. What they've decided to do is to say, yes, you can come here and we're going to love you because that's what Jesus is. Jesus is love. And that idea of love means that you can come into the church and you can do and be whoever you want to be and do whatever you want to do. Well, we are the love of Christ. But we also stand on the truth of Christ. God wants us to hold one another accountable. In it, we find guardrails. The next point, three, the church is needed because, according to Paul, this is the place where God dwells. God dwells here. In verse 15, again, same verse, um, he says, If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. The church of the living God. If you look at the sentence structure here of verse 15, this incredible truth surfaces. The church, he says. The church. Is he talking about a building? Is he talking about a structure? Not really. He, the word here is ecclesia. You may know it. It means a gathering of those who are called out by God. The church is those people who have been called out from society by God to the righteousness of Christ it's our gathering. That's the church. That's why I'm very leery of allowing every building that fills a parking lot on Sunday morning to call themselves a church. The church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not the church. They are teaching heresy. It's not the truth of God. It's a cult. The Unitarian Universalist Church down here on Proctor Road is not a church. These are not people who are called out by Christ to salvation. These are people who are deceived by Satan. We are the church. Those who have submitted to the authority of God's word have trusted in Christ and Christ alone as the only form of salvation. We are called by him. We are the church. That, that's not my words. That's Paul's words. We are the ecclesia, the called out ones. But this special gathering of people is so much more. If, as if that wasn't enough, we are so much more. He says that we are a household. The Greek word here is oikos. We are a household. Not any random building. We're not just any random gathering. This isn't just a, a random dwelling place. We are, 
where God lives. In 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, Peter says this in keeping with this same idea. He says, As you come to Him, Jesus, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are being built as a spiritual house, an oikos. And who lives there? Not an idol on a mantle, not a form of Jesus that you manufacture and put into a little painting in your mind and keep over in the corner somewhere when you, you know, need him. Not a dead philosopher like Buddha. We are the household of the living God. Look, I don't even know how to communicate this correctly. The concept is so big. I, I can't give it words. But that in this gathering here today, and maybe you sense it right now as I speak these words, the living God is dwelling here in our midst and desires to rest in each and every one of our hearts to know Him better and to love Him more. You're not going to find that anywhere else. If you go to the drum circle of 150 people and you're looking... <laughs> For meaning in life? Look, or let's be a little more real. If you're going to a football stadium on a Saturday with 100,000 other people who wear the same shirt you do, and you're looking to find identity and meaning there, keep looking. Because meaning doesn't live there. True meaning has a name. It's Christ, and He lives here. Point four, the church is needed because, according to Paul, it's to be the guardian and, guardian and supporter of truth. Gosh, we have a huge responsibility. We are the guardians and the supporters of the truth of God. Building on the architectural theme Paul bores down here even deeper in this same verse 15. He says um, how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. And then he qualifies it this way, a pillar and buttress of the truth. The church is a, a bastion of truth in a world of shifting sand. It's, it's the stanchion of truth in a world of arrogance and opinion that does not matter one bit to God. God doesn't care what the pundits on Fox and CNN think. I hate to break it to you. Honestly, God doesn't even care what I think. God cares about His Word and His truth. That's why when I come to this each week, you come with fear and trembling because I don't want to mess this up. This was, a, I think, the, um, this was the key argument of church pastors, true church pastors in California and even Canada when the governments, in the case of California, when the California government and when the national government in Canada tried to keep churches closed during COVID, people were surrounded by uncertainty. They were really struggling with depression. They were seeing symptoms of, of like PTSD and uh, they were scared. 
all these things are beginning to consume them and take over their lives. Because why? Typical, right? The government and the media, which is all we were hearing from, their facts and their truths were changing constantly. Remember, if you get the COVID vaccine, you won't get COVID. Remember, 15 days to stop the spread. And I'm not trying to be political here. I'm just using it to illustrate that man is flawed. Their truths are always going to be flawed. Some or biased, sinfully biased. So these churches in California and Canada were screaming out as loud as they could for everybody to hear that the, remember, you were only allowed to be open if you were considered a necessary uh, business or function. And the church is screaming out, hello, nothing is more necessary than us. And the police are coming in and they're arresting pastors. And in California, they're filing lawsuits against pastors who are meeting, um, holding church publicly. Paul says we are the, quote, pillar of truth. What does a pillar do? A pillar supports the weight of something. He's saying that's the church. That's the church. We support the weight of truth. We don't shy away from it, and we don't abandon it when it's inconvenient. I can read the Bible. I do read the Bible many times on a daily basis, and there are a lot of things that I come across that don't make sense to my human mind. There are a lot of things that are not convenient for the way I want to live my life. That does not matter. It is the truth. My job is to support the truth. And then he says we are the buttress of truth. Now we're getting a little more architectural on you. Do you know the difference between a pillar and a buttress? A buttress is very much a defensive term. A buttress is a beam or a wedge that kind of supports a wall so that as uh, a force comes against one side of the wall, behind it are buttresses that hold that wall up against the force that comes the other way. The wall is the truth of God's word. We stand behind it against the attacks of the world and evil and misrepresentation and deceit that constantly come against the truth of God. So me standing up here and, and articulating this stuff to you and maybe talking too long or, or, or using too many words or whatever, talking to you this morning is my way of reinforcing you so that you in turn can stand behind the truth and hold it up against the falsehood and deceit and lies of the culture in which we live. You'll see an image of that in just a second so that you understand what this looks like. When the wicked attacks come against the truth of God, it's the church that stands behind the truth. And right now, it feels like on the other side of the wall is a huge growing flood, doesn't it? Like this. Brad, do you see the buttresses? That's the church of God. According to Paul, that, that dam is the truth. The church is the buttress that stands behind the truth against everything that comes against it. That flood is growing. The waters are getting deeper. And they're surging more and more. We must not falter. We must not tire. We cannot fail at supporting God's truth. And with a little bit of good news for you, you know why you can do this? I know you can do this. Here's why. 
I've read the book and the truth wins. Matthew 16. Jesus said, He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Sounds to me like God's pretty confident. And He's confident in His people. The church. Peter made a confession of faith, and, and Jesus said, and it's on this faith in me, belief in me, that I'm going to build my church. And that church is going to come up against the gates of hell, and the gates of hell will lose. Amen. Praise God. Last point this morning. The church is needed because, according to Paul, it is the unified confessor of Christ. It's the unified confessor of Christ. Building here on verse 16, Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. This is our confession Confessionals used to be a big deal in the church. Churches would gather together and they would recite confessionals. Churches would gather together and they would write confessionals. There are some of the most meaningful and powerful writings out there about who Jesus is, the confessionals of the church. Oftentimes what this did was it, it brought the church together in a statement around the, the central tenets of what they believed. It reminded them of who they were and what they believed. They were oftentimes read together in church. Here, Paul reminds the church of its confessional of godliness. Look at, look at this confessional. Let's read it one more time. Sorry, bear with me. What we, He says in verse 16, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness manifested in the flesh. What is that? That's the incarnation of Christ. God put on flesh upon His Son and brought Him into the world. That's what we believe. He was vindicated by the Spirit. What does that mean? When the world accused Him of sin, the Spirit stood on His behalf and proved that He was sinless. Seen by the angels. What does that mean? It means he was taken up into heaven, glorified. He was proclaimed among the nations. What does that mean? The word of truth of Christ is still going forward, has and is still going forward as the gospel, the message of salvation for the world. Believed on in the world. The world is still being saved in Jesus Christ. People in Sarasota are being saved by the name of Christ today. People all across Florida are being saved under the gospel of Jesus Christ today. Today, thousands and thousands of people around the world in the darkest and most remote places of the globe are being saved by the name of Jesus Christ. We should glory in that. And then he says, and he was taken up into glory. The, the apostles stood there in awe, and they watched him ascend into heaven. Not to come back again until it's time to draw this whole thing to a close. And we get a new heaven and a new earth. But they watched him, right? They watched him. They're staring up into heaven. What? 
just happen? Where did he go? And they're looking up there, and they're, they're looking, and they're waiting. When's he going to come back? Why are you looking up into heaven? Why are you looking up into heaven? Get to work. That's the job of the church. This is our confessional. Paul said also in verse 16, great indeed. I love this. This isn't just a passing, a passing church point of recitation. Don't forget, this is, this is an overwhelming truth. Great indeed. The Greek word here is erkomai. It's translated throughout the New Testament in the same way, but, but a variety of different ways, but they all have the same theme. I'm going to give you the words that are used in the New Testament to translate this word great here, erkomai. It's used, it's, it's used in the form of great here. It's used in the form of loud. It's used in the form of big. It's used in the form of fierce. It's used in the form of huge. It's used in the form of large. It's translated in the form of mighty. This is our confessional. We believe in the gospel of Christ because it is great. It's loud. It's big. It's fierce. It's huge. It's large. It's mighty. The gospel of Christ is what the world needs. Means. And now I'm done preaching. <laughs> when we confess Christ together, we find joy, we find purpose, we find reassurance, and we find the Spirit of God. I want you to humor me. Can we, can we recite the confession all together? I, I have it up here. This is, these are Paul's words. This is the Word of God. But I'm going to ask if you would read this with me because this is who he is and what we believe, church. Let's say this together. Ready? He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in the world, taken up in glory. Lord, we praise you for who you are. We praise you for your power and your might. And we thank you for the church this morning. We thank you for the fact that we have this blessed gift as a body of believers, a place where we can not just find you, but we can find every good thing about you, your unconditional love, your healing, your mercy, your grace, your truth. We can find it here. I pray that this church would always be a pillar and a bastion and buttress of truth in a world that is kicking so hard against it. May we not falter, may we not fail, but may we march forward with your favor and with kingdom success. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.